Well, good morning and welcome to Jersey Church at Home. It is great to be together with you. And no matter where you are tuning in from, we have been looking forward to getting back together with you. Just, it was so hard to believe that it's already been a week since our Christmas Eve services. Uh, but here we are, last day of 2023, ready for 2024. And so we just wanna say thank you for tuning in this morning. Uh, wonderful day of worship ahead. And so uh, again, just thank you for being here. Looking forward to worshiping together with you. A uh, lot's happening, so just pay attention to uh, kind of our welcome time during the service here in just a few minutes, and uh, we look forward to spending this next hour with you. I'm going to pray for us, and then we are going to head into our chapel this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this morning. Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We look forward to worshiping you. Uh, whether we're here in the building, whether we're sitting in our homes, maybe a hotel, maybe listening, uh, driving somewhere today. Father, we are here to worship and we look forward to doing that. We pray it's pleasing to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Starting with holy, holy, holy.
Thank you, Kevin. Well, good morning. How is everybody? Hard to believe. Last day of 2023. Man, that is so hard to believe. It's also hard to believe it's been a week since our Christmas Eve services. And so, but here we are, last day of 2023, together to worship. And so it is good to see you this morning. If you are new with us, we just want to extend an especially warm welcome to you and say thank you for spending today with us. It means a lot to us to have you here. If you're online, uh, there's a phone number that's going to pop up on the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'd love to get to, to talk with you, text with you a little bit. But if you're here in the room and you're new, we've got a welcome area just up in our main lobby and would love for you to stop by that. If you want to get to know us a little bit better, we sure would love to get to know you a little bit better today. Well, just a handful of things to mention. Really, all these surround taking a next step. And so I'm going to just kind of walk through these. Um, our Pizza with the Pastors is coming up. And this is for people that want to know a little bit more about Jersey. Maybe you've been here for a few weeks, maybe even a couple of months. You're just kind of checking things out, and you're ready to learn just a little bit more. This would be a great opportunity for you. Come have lunch with some of our staff. Uh, lunch is free. All you need to do is register, and we'll spend about an hour or so together, just getting to know each other a little bit better, answering any questions you might have about the church. So that's coming up in January. Uh, the next week is our new members class. This is for people, uh, maybe you've already been through Pizza with the Pastors and you've been here a little bit longer and you just kind of say, you know what, I love what's happening in this church. I want to be a part of it moving forward. And so this would be a great next step for you to take our Discover Jersey new members class. You can sign up for that. It's just a four-week class you'll walk through and, uh, and learn really kind of a deep dive into what makes Jersey, Jersey. And so look forward to meeting you in that class should you sign up for it. Finally, uh, this is really for everybody. We are kicking off a brand new series and brand new grow group study in January. The series and the study will begin on January 14th. Pastor Matt's actually going to preach an introductory message next Sunday. So he's going to kind of tee things up for us. But we would sure love to encourage everybody to be here for this series and this study called Living Life Upside Down. We're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And what we're going to be doing is really looking at how to live differently in a culture that is drifting further and further away from God, seemingly daily. And so that's where we're going to spend our time together over the next six, seven weeks as we look at the Sermon on the Mount and learn how to live life upside down. Well, I'm going to pray for us, and then our worship is going to continue this morning, uh, and then Luke is going to come and preach for us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We do thank you for this time that we have. Um, Heavenly Father, as we do sit here at the end of one year, uh, really kind of just sit um, really on, on the precipice of a brand new year, 2024, um, we do pray, Heavenly Father, over this next year as we get started, as we wake up tomorrow, really our, our thoughts, our heartbeat, what we want to do is to seek you first, to seek your kingdom first, to seek your righteousness. And that's exactly where we want to be as we begin 2024. In Jesus' name, amen. such a humble birth still be heralded all these centuries later. This was not just any baby. He was the Messiah, our Savior. We will sing praise to his name until the end of time and on into eternity. Your praise, Lord Jesus, goes on. Hallelujah.
Man, thank you, Heidi, and the choir. That was amazing. Perfect time to come in for a Sunday morning, last Sunday of the year. If you don't know me, my name is Luke Reininger, and um, I'm so grateful to Pastor Matt for allowing me to be sharing God's word with you this morning and for him to share his pulpit and give me this opportunity. Prayerfully, he won't regret that decision 30 minutes from now, but we will see. Now, uh, our text this morning comes from Romans chapter 12, and we'll be starting in verse 9. So if you would, as you make your way to Romans chapter 12, verse 9, I have a question for you. Has anybody here ever been on a blind date? Anybody ever been on a blind date? Okay, thank goodness, two people. So for the rest of you, I got a little nervous, but for the rest of you, this is not relevant. So that's that's exactly what you want to hear. Now, if you do go on a blind date, Uh, Just don't do what this gentleman did when he went on his blind date. So uh, a young college kid goes up to his roommate and he says, hey, I just want you to know that I set up a blind date for you and my cousin tomorrow. And the roommate's like, whoa, hold on. I don't don't do blind dates. And he goes, no, 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 trust me. You're really going to like her, I promise. She's smart. She's funny. She's very pretty. And you know what? Just in case you need a backup plan, just do what I do when I go on a blind date. See, when I go on a blind date and I get to where I'm meeting this person, I send a text to a friend and I say, hey, can you call me in three minutes? That way, you know, when I see the girl, if she's not very attractive and I really don't want to waste the next couple of hours pretending like I want to be there, uh, when my friend calls, I'll just answer the phone and I'll say something like, oh, no, are you serious? I can't believe it. I am so sorry. I'll be right there. And then when I hang up the phone, I just tell the girl, you know, I'm so sorry there was an emergency, I just have to go. But, you know, when I meet this girl, if she's very attractive and I want to continue the date, then when my friend calls, I'll just ignore the call, and then I'm good to go. And so the roommate is like, you know what, okay, I'll I'll go, you know, meet your cousin. So the next day, he uh, pulls up to this young lady's apartment, and as he uh, parks, he sends a text to a friend. He says, hey, can you call me in three minutes, please? I just got here. So as he walks up and he knocks on the door, man, when this young lady opens the door, it was love at first sight. I mean, his jaw just dropped. He couldn't believe someone so beautiful could even come from the same family tree as his friend. And so naturally, as they're making small talk, he feels his phone ring and he ignores the call. He just couldn't wait to continue this date. So as he turns and opens his mouth to say something to this young lady, she pulls out her phone and says, oh no, are you serious? I am so sorry. I'll be right there. She hangs up her phone and says to the roommate, I'm so sorry there was an emergency and I just have to go. And she slams that door in his face and there was never another opportunity for a date. Now, you may be wondering, Luke, is that a true story? Maybe. You may also be wondering, Luke, was that story about you? Maybe. That's not our point here. The point of this story is that Romans chapter 12, verse 9, starts with this concept of love. And I believe that the rest of the verses in our section of Scripture are to be understood with this true biblical love in mind. So if you would, please. Join with me in reading Romans chapter 12, and we'll be looking at verses 9 through 18. So verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack diligence and zeal, be fervent in the spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer, share with the saints in their needs, pursue hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, instead associate with the humble, do not be wise in your own estimation, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. And if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Amen. So our passage this morning starts with a command about love. 
right? And in fact, Scripture gives 30 commands from verses 9 through 21, the end of this chapter. Now, the good news is, is that these commands, for the most part, are pretty easy to understand. But for our time this morning, we don't have the time to dive into all 30 commands in depth. So I want to provide you with a brief outline of what we are going to cover this morning. So our first point for you note takers is, what is true love? Our second point is going to be, true love is not hypocritical. And then our third point is going to be, true love is given to others. And we're going to talk about those inside the church and outside the church. So our first point is, what is true love? We're going to answer that question, I hope. Our second point is, true love is not hypocritical. And then our third point is, true love is given to others, both inside and outside the church. So our first point, what is true love? This comes from verse 9, which says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil. Cling to what is good. See, this word love is used in many different ways in our culture, isn't it? Right? We, We say things like, I love my wife. I love pizza. I love the beach. I love the color blue. But see, when we, when we say that, when I say that I love my wife, I would hope that you all know that the love that I have for my wife is not the same way that I love pizza. Because when I say that I love pizza, I don't mean that, that I want a personal relationship with pizza or that I care about pizza's well-being, right? I mean that I prefer pizza more regularly than other types of foods. But my love for pizza doesn't really extend beyond the desire to get something, Now, that is not the same way that I love my wife. Now, she's not here, so she's not going to hear this. Uh, But could you imagine if I said something like this to my wife? Hey, babe, I want you to know that my love for you is kind of like how I love pizza. (laughs) See, I, I prefer you more than most women, and I like spending time with you, you know, when I want something. But I don't really want a personal relationship with you or... I don't really care about your well-being. Yeah, if I said that to my wife, I would wake up dead. (laughs) Yes. So, when a person says to you that they love you, how do they love you? Do they mean they love you in a way that they desire a more in-depth relationship with you? Or do they mean in the pizza love kind of way, where in all reality, they just want to get something from you? Now, if you didn't know this, I'm a high school teacher, and so even though we're on Christmas break, I'm going to give you a little pop quiz this morning. Now, how many of you just got sweaty palms? Test anxiety is a real thing. Yep. But don't worry. It's not graded. You're going to be okay. There are two questions. So here's your pop quiz. What is the Greek word for love that we most often think about describing God's love for us? Gosh, you didn't have to be nervous. Agape. That was really good. I bet 9 o'clock can't do that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yes, agape love. Wonderful. So one down, one to go. When the Bible says in verse 9 of our text, to let love be without hypocrisy, what Greek word for love do you think is used there? And I'm going to give you a hint. It's the same word you just said. Agape. See? You nailed it. So all you with test anxiety... You are done. You can relax now. There are no more pop quizzes. Now, why is it important for us today to know that that word for love is agape and not one of the other kinds of biblical love? Well, let's look. Well, when we normally think of agape love, we think about God's love for us, correct? Uh, correct? And so, and that is a fine idea to kind of have in our brains. But here in this passage, Paul uses agape not to describe God's love for us, but to describe how we, his children, are to love one another. Look with me, please, at Romans chapter 12, verse 2, which says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Think about that for a moment. We should be so continuously transformed by God's Holy Spirit within us And by his uh, display of perfect love for us on the cross, that we love one another with that same kind of agape love that he, the Father, has for us. So because God's love is infinite, then that love should overflow from us to others who are made in his image, which is going to be point three. 
So even though the word love isn't explicitly stated in every verse after verse 9, I believe that this type of agape love is implied. It's like the building block throughout the rest of this passage. So how do we know what the biblical definition for true love is? Well, Mr. Wells, I'm glad you asked. The first time the word love appears in the Bible is in the book of Genesis, which may not be surprising. And if we look at that word and its meaning, we have a few things, and I'm going to give you a definition here. But it kind of means this act of doing, and it's connected with the idea of action or obedience. And in its root also means to give. So if we combine all that together, we could say that the biblical definition for love may be described as something like this. Love wants more to give than to get. So true biblical love wants more to give than to get. Now Jesus also taught this in John chapter 13. You don't have to turn there, but John 13, 35 He said that his disciples should love one another with this agape love. He used that same word. Why? So that the world would know who were his disciples by the way that they would love one another. So our only hope in understanding and and in keeping these 30 commands from verses 9 through the end of this chapter is through the uh, the transforming power of the gospel. in in allowing God's agape-like love to instill in us a greater desire to give than to get. Now, there's something else in the second half of verse 9 that I want to call your attention to. Scripture says that true love detests evil and clings to what is good. What does that mean? To detest evil literally means to hate evil exceedingly. And to cling to what is good is actually, it means to cleave together as in a marriage. Now, that might sound strange at first, doesn't it, that that we have this agape love and hate in the same verse, but to love with an agape-like love, the church must hate what God hates, and they must love what God loves. See, the more we grow in our love for Jesus Christ, the more we grow in our hatred of sin. The more that we are transformed into the image of our Savior, then the more that we detest not only our own sin, but the sin in the world. I believe that one of the greatest weaknesses in the American church is not necessarily intolerance, but actually tolerance for the things that are evil. One evil that God detests of many is sexual immorality. And man, we are just bombarded with that in our culture, aren't we? It's it's normalized, right? In In our music, social media, on television, even the shows geared toward children sneak in these unbiblical principles. From my own experience, when the movie Fifty Shades of Grey came out, uh, my own boss said to me that my wife and I needed to watch the movie because it would radically change our marriage. Now, I didn't say this then, but bringing in sexual immorality into a relationship does not provide strength. Only a relationship with the God who created marriage can fully satisfy every aspect of our lives. Now, I know that Fifty Shades of Grey might seem like an extreme example, but it begs the question, how much sexual immorality is okay in the eyes of God? Is it okay to just have, you know, a little bit enter in? Oh, may we cry out like the psalmist, to turn our eyes from looking at what is worthless and to give us life in his ways. See, there is a constant pressure to conform to this world, but we must continuously be transformed into the image of Christ and and guard our hearts and minds and homes against all that which God hates. So to recap, point one, what is true love? True love wants more to give than to get. And true love is so transformed by the gospel through God's spirit that, that we love what God loves and we hate what God hates. Now, there's something else in verse 9 that true love is not, and that is our second point. True love is not hypocritical, right? What does it mean to let love be without hypocrisy? How do we understand that? See, when I think of a hypocrite, I think of somebody saying, hey, don't drink straight from the container, and then late at night, you catch them drinking from the carton of milk like a deer in headlights, right? Now, sure, that is hypocritical, but In the first century, this word for hypocrite, it actually carries this idea of an actor on stage. It's somebody who wears a mask. 
See, back then, actors would hold up a mask that would display different emotions, and it didn't matter what the emotion was behind the mask. Um, so in order to love without hypocrisy in a, a biblical way, we have to love others in a genuine way. It's love without a mask. See, the family of God should never become a stage that is filled with fake love. Now, why did Jesus call some religious leaders hypocrites? Pretty strong language. Because the thing is, is many times the religious leaders were actually doing the right things, but they were doing them with the wrong heart. So this means that we can serve, give, read, and pray. We can, we can do all these good things, but if we do them with the wrong heart, then they are nothing in the eyes of God. The religious leaders in Jesus' day, they were performing their religious duties as with a mask. See, they thought they knew God, but their hearts were far from him. One commentator described hypocrisy this way. He said, hypocrisy is to do the devil's work in God's uniform. Man, that just like packs a punch, doesn't it? Hypocrisy is to do the devil's work in God's uniform. It means that we don't compliment someone to their face when we don't actually mean what we're saying. And that's what we would call flattery, right? Nor do we talk poorly about others behind their back, which is what we would call gossip. But man, it's easy to fall into this trap of gossip, isn't it? At the office, with your friends, or even at home. But just because talking about others is easy to do, believers must never partake in gossip. And when we do, because unfortunately it's inevitable for most of us, we must take off the mask, repent, confess, seek forgiveness for the purpose of purpose of unity in the body of Christ, for the purpose of growing in Christ-likeness, and for the purpose of displaying true love for one another as without a mask. Now, that might sound really good. Hey, don't participate in gossip. But how can we stop ourselves from doing this? Uh, I have four quick suggestions. So first, and maybe just one of these will appeal to you, but first, try to be aware of the conversations that are already occurring and so are those conversations leading toward a way that speaks about another negatively? So just awareness. Second, we may try to ask ourselves something like, is what I'm about to say edifying to those who will hear it? Or does what I'm about to say build up the person that I'm speaking about? Third, when a conversation is kind of going in a gopacy, gopacy, that's not a word, uh, I meant to say gossip B direction, but I don't know if that's a word. Uh, I teach math. Anyway. <clears throat> now, if, if the conversation is going towards this like gossipy kind of direction, then maybe we could say something like, try to kind of change the subject by saying something like, I'm not sure I feel comfortable talking about that person when they're not here. Just something simple, gentle, kind of steer the conversation away. Finally, maybe we can memorize a verse. There are many verses that talk about the tongue, but one, you don't have to turn there, but if you want to write it down, James 3, 9, which says, with the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Brothers and sisters, we are commanded to love one another without a mask. And gossiping has no place coming from the mouths of the family of God. So to conclude our second point, loving without hypocrisy means that true agape-like love will always be as without a mask. It will be in line with God's truth and seek the spiritual good of others. Now the rest of uh, Romans chapter 12 tells us how believers are to demonstrate this agape love, not only for one another, but also those who are outside of the body of Christ. And that's going to be our third point, that true love is given to others. Now, part of giving love to others comes out of verse 10. And in verse 10, we're told to outdo, interesting word, one another in showing honor. In verse 11, we're told to be fervent in the spirit, which literally means to be boiling over or to set aflame by the spirit of God. Now, this term for outdo, this is interesting. It only occurs this one time in the entire New Testament. And it doesn't suggest this kind of conceited one-upmanship, but actually exemplary behavior. It carries the idea of honoring one another so much through service that you lead others to model your own behavior. 
And we can actually do this rightly when we are filled with God's Spirit. See, honoring one another means that you serve somebody as though they deserve to be served. You count their needs greater than your own. Think about how radical this would have been in the first century. So masters were called to honor their slaves. Men were called to honor women. This was a radical shift in the minds of those living in that culture, but they were called to love in the same way that Jesus loved them. I think a great example of Jesus kind of modeling this, taking the lead and honoring one another, is when he washed the feet of his disciples. And yes, the king of glory even took the lead by washing the feet of Judas, even though he knew he was about to betray him. So, the question that I have for us this morning is, have, have you lost that passion, that fervency for Christ that you once had? Have you been a Christian so long that you just find yourself going through the motions? See, if we want to fan that desire into flame again, then we need to constantly look for ways to be conformed into the image of Christ, as Romans 12 Two said. We need to be in community. We need to be in God's word and spending time in prayer and doing what he commands. If the king and the creator of the universe, full of the spirit, could wash the disciples' nasty, stinking feet, then what task are we too good for? What task is beneath us? Because remember, Jesus did not come here to get. He came here to give. And he gave his life for you. And we are also here to give to others and not to get. Now, verse 13 tells us another way that we are to love one another. And that is to share with the saints in their needs and to pursue hospitality. And this carries the idea of having this open hand, right? Where we see someone in need, especially those in the body of Christ, and we help them in their need, we're displaying this agape love for our brothers and sisters. Now, what about hospitality? The thing is, being hospitable doesn't mean that you have to have the perfect house, the perfect yard, the perfect food, right? You don't need some special gift of hospitality, although I think some people lean that way. Remember that these are commands for every Christian. So we need to get to know others in, in our church and in our community. Listen to them and ask questions to get to know them better. Invite them over for coffee or something similar. It, it doesn't have to be this grand meal and experience, But it does take time. And to be honest, most people, it means more to them to have your time than it would to have some grand, fancy meal and experience. Now, as we spend time in community with one another, then we can more easily keep the commands in verse 15, which say to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. See, true love enters into the emotions of others. But just so you know, I have a hard time with that. My pride gets in the way and I have a hard time with rejoicing with others who are rejoicing. It's easier for me to weep with those who weep. Anybody else like that or is it just me, like the two people who've been on a blind date? It's like I want to rejoice when they're rejoicing, but do thoughts enter your mind maybe? These prideful thoughts like, man, why haven't haven't I gotten the promotion? Why don't I have some random rich uncle who left me his estate? How do they get into that school? I'm smarter than they are. Man, why are all my friends getting engaged and I'm still alone? See, it's easy to let those thoughts get in, but we must fight pride to keep it out. Pride is addressed in our text in verse 16 and really pretty much everywhere else in the Bible. Um, But see, if we are to live in harmony with one another, if we are to have unity in the body of Christ, then pride must be crushed with humility. Pride cannot rejoice with others who are rejoicing, but humility can rejoice and show agape love as without a mask. Now, pride may be the greatest barrier to unity. Think about most broken marriages, split churches, friendships that crumbled. Somewhere along the way, pride ruled the terrain. But a prideful Christian is an oxymoron. Right? It's a contradiction in terms. God's word says in more than one place that God opposes the proud right? and gives grace to the humble. So in order to give true love to those in the body of Christ, we must be zealous for the things of God. Take the lead in honoring one another. Destroy pride and pursue hospitality. 
Now, how do we show love to others when we're being persecuted? Let's quickly look at a few more verses. So first, if you jump back to verse 14, it says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Now, that's an interesting verse because notice how verse 14 is in the same section about talking about how we ought to love one another. So that means people in the body of Christ. This means that we can sometimes expect to be hurt by other believers. But how can that be possible? You see, sheep uh, can be kind of like docile, kind of dumb, right? But because of pride, sometimes sheep bite. And all of us have little sheep bite marks on us, right? And we're most likely responsible for a few bite marks on other believers. Why? Why? Because we are deeply flawed humans trying to serve a perfectly holy God. Now, I know that's not an excuse, but let's look at how Jesus responded when his friends abandoned him. What did he say when he was being beaten, mocked, and eventually crucified by those that he not only created, but came to save? Remember that as Jesus was about to give up his life, he begged for the forgiveness of those that were doing this to him. And we are called to forgive one another with that same heart. And rather than telling the thief on the cross next to Jesus how much he deserved what he got, Jesus promises to take him to paradise that very day. So I have to ask, what is our excuse for responding harshly or with unkind words to other sheep when they bite? Only that our fleshly nature is just still at war with our new nature in Christ. So when we respond wrongly, and for most of us we will, we must repent And seek forgiveness. A wise person once said about reconciling conflict that the more spiritually mature person will be the first to seek reconciliation. Yeah, I don't like that. You know, especially if I'm the one in the wrong, I want them to come to me. That's so much easier. But man, me swallowing my pride and going to someone else, that's so, so challenging. But that's just one of the areas of needed growth in my own life and and maybe for some of us in this room as well. Now let's quickly look at verse 12. Verse 12 says to be patient in affliction, which was a teaching that Paul gave to every church. See, affliction is the backdrop of the Christian life. And if you haven't experienced affliction yet, you will. But here's what I want you to take away. Satan's design for affliction is to destroy our faith. But God's design for affliction is to refine our faith. See, Jesus doesn't abandon you in trials. He is walking with you. Imagine if we could change our mindset to look at affliction for the sake of Christ as a privilege rather than a punishment. Now, unfortunately, pride also gets in the way of loving those outside of the body of Christ, and especially in times of affliction. So verse 17 says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. And so I know this is probably going to be a shocking statement, but when you look at me, I'm not what you would call like an alpha male. (laughs) You feel me? Um, See, when it comes to fight or flight, I'm more of a flight kind of guy. And I recently heard that there was a third category called fawn, but to be honest, that felt too much like something Pastor John would hunt. So I, (laughs) I wanted to leave that one out. But anyway, some of you are fighters, right? You enjoy conflict. You love the debate, man. I mean, you're quick witted. That wasn't a, that wasn't a good snap. That was bad. Anyway, pretend it was very, very good. I mean, you're quick-witted, right? But sometimes you have that sharp tongue that's used towards those, maybe on social media, maybe within your own homes, your spouse, your children, maybe others in or outside this church. In an evil response to another, whether, whether towards a member of the body of Christ or someone outside of the body of Christ is never permissible by Jesus in the Christian walk. We are called to pray for those who persecute us. We're, we have to pray not only for their salvation, but for our heart to be softened toward them. Our conduct should be such that no one looking in from the outside could say that we acted dishonorably. So never let the inability to live at peace with someone else be because you didn't genuinely try to live at peace with them. So what can we do with this passage? As As the band gets ready to come up and as we enter the new year tomorrow, let us focus on and and be intentional about being more hospitable, fleeing from gossip, maybe reconciling a relationship, or guarding our sharp tongues. 
Whatever it may be, uh, whatever it may be for you, let us, let us take off our masks and let us put on Christ and love one another with this godly, agape-like love without hypocrisy so that the world would know that we are his disciples by the love that we give to one another. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning and for those that, that have come to, to be with us in person and online. Lord, I pray that whatever stood out to us in this sermon, that as we start this new year in our homes, in our work, in our communities, that we would put these ideas into practice. That we would not just read these commands, but we would be doers of your word and seek to glorify you and know you more. Thank you for your word and for who you are. It's in the wonderful and beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning as we listen to Luke really walk through uh, that, that scripture and really all those different commands, you know, I wonder if our actions, the way we live our daily lives, the things that we respond to, the way we behave, how, how we respond to people, I wonder if our actions reflect Jesus. Uh, as Luke really wrapped up right there at the end, I wonder if, if the world, and, and really maybe even making that a little more personal, the people that we interact with on a daily basis, I wonder if they would recognize that we are followers, disciples of Christ, because of our love, because of the way we treat them. So as we listen to that passage, I know, you know that, that's something where, where God can just work on your heart. And so my hope and my prayer is that you would allow him to do that. Maybe some of you are watching this morning. Maybe you're finding us for the first time and you would just say, uh, Brian, I wanna know more about what Luke was talking about. And so I would just like to talk with somebody. Uh, reach out to us, send us a text message, send us an email, and we would love to respond to you. Uh, some of you may just be out there and be like, you know, Brian, we're, we're, I'm going through some things, maybe in my family, uh, maybe just in my personal life, maybe some work issues. It could be a, 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 a new, numerous amount of things. Whatever it is that you're walking through, we would like to be able to pray with you. And so if you wanna reach out to us and just say, Brian, here's how you can pray for me, we would certainly love the opportunity to be able to do that. Well, listen, we just wanna say thank you again for being with us today. We are looking forward already to next week. And so Pastor Matt is going to preach that introductory sermon to our uh, Living Life Upside Down series. So we look forward to really kind of jump-starting that series. And then again, we just want to encourage you, make sure starting next week that you are joining us each and every week as we make our way through this series, Living Life Upside Down. We'll see you next week.